If the citizens of the world of beer were to choose a capital, it might be right here. Under the shaded trees of the Augustiner Beer Garden in Munich, Germany. Here, the beer is still tapped out of wooden barrels, which are rapidly drained. Until the physically fit staff literally roll out the barrel again. For the waiters and waitresses, who lug up to 12 one liter glasses of beer at a time, it's quite a workout. But for the customers, it's time for the unique form of peace and contentment found only in the beer garden. The Bavarians call it Gemutli. I think the word comfortable comes closest. It's a bit more than comfortable. It's joyful. It's, it's nice, relaxing. It's more than one meaning. We say gemütlich. And it's a wonderful break during the day to sit here and have the best beer in the world. Through the millennia, beer has been, and continues to be, many things. A drink of celebration. A social lubricant. A tonic at the end of a hard day. Even a valuable source of nutrition. But beer doesn't brew itself. It emerges from a heady mixture of science, sweat, and imagination. The single greatest source of beer flows from St. Louis, Missouri-based Anheuser-Busch. Its breweries account for 12% of all beer on Earth. You may have heard of their flagship beer. St. Louis Brewery has the, the capacity to produce about 16 million barrels of beer in a year. 31 gallons per barrel, that's the conversion, so you can do the math. It's a large brewery, no question. But despite the size of the place, the brewers here are still just making beer, turning grains into a carbonated low-alcohol beverage. The recipe calls first for malted barley. Malt is the single most important and the largest ingredient in beer. You can malt other grains, but barley is considered to be a superior grain for brewing. Malting the barley consists of soaking the grain in warm water until it begins to germinate, just enough to activate the enzymes that will convert starch to sugar. And then just when the green shoot is about to emerge from the barley kernel, you kiln it, you roast it. Roasting helps determine the flavor and color of the beer. It also halts the sugar conversion process, which will resume under much more precise conditions in the brew house. This vessel is called a mash tun, and it's really the beginning of the brewing process. This is the first time we bring water and grain together. And the purpose of this vessel is to mix the malt and the water and to begin the extraction process of the starches and the flavors from the, from the malt. We start at about 109, 110 degrees, and then we slowly raise up the temperature in order to maximize the enzyme conversion of starch to sugar. Now, why is that important for a brewer? Because sugar is what the yeast will convert to alcohol and carbon dioxide during the fermentation. Brewer's yeast is not able to use starch itself. It can only feed on sugar. In the Budweiser recipe, the malted barley is combined with a second non-malted grain, rice, which is also used for its sugars and to lighten the flavor of the beer. After the barley is offered all its precious sugars, it makes a final sacrifice. The husks form a perfect filter bed as the sugary, frothy mixture, now called wort, is drawn off to the brew kettle. As you can see, it's a very vigorous boil. A lot of steam used in this process in order to boil the brew. Boiling goes on for over an hour, and some very important things are happening here. First of all, we're sterilizing the brew with heat. We're also developing some color during the boiling process. 
and we're beginning to precipitate and take some of the protein out of the wort that later on may cause a problem with haze in the beer. It's during the boil that brewers add beer's most characteristic flavor, hops. The pungent, oily, flowering plant known as Humulus lupulus, a relative of cannabis, delivers the smack of bitterness crucial to beer. A lot of people don't know that hops are actually a flower from a vining perennial plant. And that little flower is densely packed with flavor, uh, both flavor in the form of a very characteristic hop aroma and also bitterness. Hops are really the spice of beer. At Anheuser-Busch, the brewmasters taste test their hop varieties by making a special hop tea. They also concoct a rice tea, sample the brewery's water, and taste the various stages of wort as it becomes beer. Once the boiled wort is filtered, it's ready to leave the hot side of brewing and enter the cold side, where fermentation will begin. First, the hot wort pipe passes through this heat exchanger, not unlike a giant radiator, where 638 chilled metal plates cool the brew quickly. This is crucial to keeping the wort free of contaminating bacteria, which would love to feast on all that sugar. That meal is reserved for one very special guest, brewer's yeast. Well, without yeast, there would be no beer. Yeast is actually a living organism, and they derive their food energy from the fermentation of sugar. These are single-celled organisms. They consume the sugar, and they convert it to alcohol and carbon dioxide. Just as the alcohol gives beer its buzz, the CO2 provides the fizz. And it all happens here. This is our primary fermentation cellar. In here we have 37 vessels which contain approximately 180,000 gallons of beer each. We fill about five of these a day. It will sit under precise temperature control and a precise temperature profile. We use glycol to help cool the fermenter during this time. Uh, the glycol is at 30 degrees Fahrenheit and we have precise control on that to make sure that that the tank stays within plus or minus 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit of its set point. The chilling system counteracts the significant heat produced by fermentation. I have a lot of technology to tell us what's going on here. We have temperature transmitters, yeast growth monitors, and, and, and the like. But what still is more important than that is the overall taste of the beer. A tough job, but brewers around the world are up to the task. At this point in the process, the yeast has doubled, tripled in size. The yeast will be removed in the filtration process as we move forward. After the yeast works its magic for five to seven days, the liquid is pumped into one of 378 massive storage tanks in the brewery's chili cellars. Each one of these tanks is 120,000 gallons. The Budweiser, as it's transferred in, will be stored here for 21 days. And what's happening during that time frame is we're developing flavor, maturation, also the natural carbonation. After the 21 pressure-filled days in the aging cellar and a final filtration, the golden fermented beverage has earned the name beer. But the pressure doesn't let up as the product is pumped into one of three airtight vessels, cans, bottles, and the venerable draft keg. The beer is pumped from our Stockhouse 19, uh, which is our finishing cellar, here to a surge tank, and then we deliver the beer through a pump that actually chills the cake from the bottom up, ensuring that we purge the cake properly. This particular line can fill a thousand cakes per hour. An impressive amount of beer to be sure, but draft beer makes up only 10% of Anheuser-Busch's business. The lion's share of brew is fed into the bottle carousel, which fills up to 1,300 per minute, and the blindingly fast canning line, which fills about 2,000 per minute. That's more than five six-packs every second. When you pop open one of these, you're lifting the lid on thousands of years of brewing history. No one knows when the first beer was brewed. It very well could have been Amazonia, perhaps even New Guinea, where you had complex farming of fermentable 
cereals 10,000 years ago. The earliest physical evidence of a barley-based alcoholic beverage comes from 3500 BC and the Sumerian traders in what's now Iran. So we did an analysis of a very large pottery vessel from this site which had uh, inside of it a compound called beer stone or calcium oxalate which is very specific to barley beer. The inside of the Sumerian brew pot was grooved apparently to capture some of this beer stone an undesirable residue the brewers still must remove from their kettles today. This small innovation hints at the much larger culture of beer in the ancient Near East. One of the things that's made beer so valuable and uh, so essential to civilization is that it is liquid bread. It was a way to store a crop, ferment it, put alcohol in it, uh, stabilize it, and that people could consume this over a long period of time. There's strong evidence to suggest that it was beer, more so than bread, that drove these cultures to domesticate cereal crops, leading to civilization itself. You know, which came first, bread or beer? And, you know, if you had your choice, uh, which would it be? Uh, but there's, you know, very practical reasons for why beer might have been what they were after when they started domesticating some of these grains. Uh, one would be the nutritional values actually increased when you go through the fermentation process. And then you've got the issue of mind-altering effects, which I don't think should be diminished because, you know, for early humans especially, this was some sort of a mystery. The fermentation process was also a mystery. But the Sumerians and other early brewers observed that adding honey, dates, or grapes helped get it started. Grapes, dates, figs, and so on can have very high sugar. That attracts insects that are carrying the yeast. But this particular yeast that's so important to beer making, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is not airborne. It has to be transferred, you know, either by uh, an insect or mechanically, you know, from one place to another. While beer today is thought of as the ultimate guy's drink, ancient brewers were overwhelmingly women. Such was the case in the ancient world's beer capital, Egypt. This is close to 4,000 years old and is from a tomb. Uh, what we see here is what goes on to this day in places like Peru and Africa, even Scandinavian countries. We have a woman leaning over a basket. This basket is set on top of a fermenting vessel. It's believed that Egyptian brewers squeezed partially baked bread through the sieve-like basket and mixed it with water in the fermenting vessel. You had raw dough, which either had a replicated or previously used yeast, or it was spontaneously fermented. Ancient Egyptian society was obsessed with beer. The beverage was produced in massive quantities and served as everything from payment for the workers who built the pyramids to a ritual libation poured into the mouths of the dead. The wealthy were buried alongside entire miniature breweries, such as this one, ensuring that they would have the life-sustaining drink for eternity. The very symbol for food was a jug of beer and a round cake. The city of Pelusium on the northeast bank of the Nile Delta was devoted entirely to commercial, large-scale brewing of a bewildering variety, 50, 60 varieties of beer, which were shipped as far away as India. It was, and in my view, remains the world's all-time beer capital, dwarfing even Munich. But as extensive as beer making was in the ancient world, the art of brewing was just getting started. Royal decrees, monks, and scientists would change the nature of beer forever. The Dogfish Head Brewery in Delaware is a thoroughly modern operation. But some of its recipes harken back to the very roots of brewing. One of the results is Midas Touch, a beer inspired by a party that took place 2,700 years ago. Midas Touch is brewed with ingredients based on residue from some of the 157 drinking vessels found buried alongside the body of an Iron Age Phrygian king. We don't know for sure, you know, whether it is really King Midas that's in that tomb. 
but it's, it's approximately the right time. And we know there was a real King Midas, and it certainly is such a rich tomb that it has to be a member of the royal family. Using infrared spectrometry and gas chromatography, anthropologist Patrick McGovern determined that the residues found on these vessels were from a barley-based alcoholic beverage, beer. He worked with Sam Caligioni and his team of brewers to resurrect and bottle the ancient brew. Midas Hudge contains um, sugars extracted from malted barley, as well as honey and uh, muscat grape juice. It's uh, spiced with um, sapphire. And it's really like a liquid uh, time capsule, really, that we can step back and say, wow, it's pretty cool to know this is what our ancestors were experimenting with, too, and enjoying. The number and size of the drinking bowl suggest that the deceased wasn't the only one who ended up flat on his back. For those uh, who just wanted to get a, a slight taste, you have the one liter bowl type here. But those with a little bit higher status and greater thirst uh, could go with the two liter variety that I have here. This powerful thirst for beer tended to travel along with the domestication of grains. From the Middle East to Europe, where the art of brewing was reborn. Through the Middle Ages, beer, or as it was more often called, ale, was spiced with an herbal mixture called gruet. It ended up being controlled by the church, uh, which licensed its use, and it contained things like bog myrtle, yarrow, and various other ingredients that were kept secret by the church. Ale was the lifeblood of the people. Since the water in ale had been boiled, and the brew sterilized by alcohol. It was far cleaner than water. It was safe. It tasted good. It uh, cheered one up, one mood up in the face of the Black Death or whatever horrible menace was coming over the hill next. Um, terribly important. An unbroken tradition of brewing from the Middle Ages to today can be seen here at the Weinstefan Brewery in Freising, Germany. Having brewed beer here since the year 1040, it has earned the distinction of being the world's oldest working brewery. This brewery and this region of Bavaria has seen many of the most important changes to beer, including perhaps the earliest use of beer's signature flavor, hops. We know that the using of hops was well known in the 8th century. It was used here also in Weinstefan Monastery. On harvest day, Frank Pfeiffer and hops farmer Albert Eisenmann inspect their bounty of legendary Hollertau hops. Wow. <laughs> when I open it, you can see the yellow particles inside. It is a, a lupulin. It contains the bitter components of the hops. Very fresh. The introduction of hops ended the age of gruet and revolutionized brewing. Hops are a natural preservative. They prevent harmful bacteria from spoiling the beer. With hops, brewers could rely on something other than alcohol to make their beers last. Beer could be brewed with less malt, and it could travel farther. And something else happened. Medieval beer drinkers grew to love hops' bitter taste, which balanced the sweetness of malt. Bavaria by the 16th century, hops were the law of the land. You have to know that we have a special law for to make beer in Germany, and also especially in Bavaria. It's called the Reinheitsgebot, and was installed in 1516 here by the Bavarian dukes. We only are allowed to use malt, hops, and water. The Reinheitsgebot, or German Purity Law, was the first food safety law. It's still enforced in Bavaria, where the use of unmalted grains, such as rice or corn, or any added flavors, are strictly verboten. Centuries later, the law was amended to include a fourth ingredient, yeast, once it was understood. Weinstefan, like many breweries in Central Europe, began as a monastery. For centuries, monks were the innovators in the science of brewing. The monasteries 
were the, the seats of learning. And so they were furthering the technology of beer and making it a much more consistent product. They learned rudimentary heat transfer, how to make the kettles work better, how to evenly distribute heat, how to control some of the heat in the mash. Monasteries produced and drank prodigious amounts of ale. Despite their mastery, the monks and other medieval beer makers were still brewing in the dark. They had yet to learn that yeast was a living organism. They were only thinking that the ghosts of a brewery that produced the beer. As early as the 15th century, Bavarian and Bohemian brewers began cold storing, or in German, lagering their beers in alpine caves or cellars packed with ice. Over time, they began to notice a change in their beer. As they put them in a cellar, the beer got a much smoother taste as time went on. And actually, what was happening was it was the lager yeast, which can work in cool temperatures, when they were able to isolate that lager yeast cell and start building up colonies of lager yeast, they ended up brewing a beer that was much smoother and not as fruity as an ale. And thus, lager, still the most popular beer style in the world, was born. Whereas ale yeast is a top fermenting organism that works best at warm temperatures, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, lager yeast ferments on the bottom of the vessel and thrives only at cold temperatures, about 40 degrees. By the mid-19th century, the cleaner tasting lagers dominated the European beer style. In the British Isles, though, strongly flavored ales remained king. And they still are today. Both in England and on the continent, brewing science and technology grew more precise. Thermometers allowed for consistency in temperature, from mashing all the way to fermentation. And the hydrometer allowed brewers to control the sugar levels, or gravity. At the end of the brew day, they're going to measure the work. And uh, you'll take a measurement and it will float in the tube. And the more sugars that you have, in that wort will give you the higher alcohol potential. And so when we take that measurement and we've got a lot of sugars, it's gonna push this out pretty high. And at the end of fermentation, when the sugars are gone and alcohol is present, this thing will begin to fall. In 1842, in the Bohemian town of Pilsen, the new cold fermenting yeast and modern kilns to more precisely roast the malt led to a kind of super lager, a new golden beer known as Pilsner, which would eventually sweep the world. Pilsner beer, which is in the lager family as a result of all that technology that was developed in the 1800s, the color of this beer comes from uh, very light colored grains. And that, again, it was the temperature control that brewers gained in the late 1800s on an industrial scale. And it's the father of our American Pilsner-style beers that so many people enjoy today. American beer, the source of much debate. But one thing remains clear. In the 19th century, American brewers would change the industry forever. America's long, often tempestuous love affair with beer began in 1620 in the waters off Plymouth Rock when the passengers on the Mayflower made a startling discovery. The pilgrims didn't mean to come here to Massachusetts. They knew the weather was crummy. They wanted to go further south, but as William Bradford, their diarist, wrote, we must make our landfall, our victuals are much spent, especially our beer. So the pilgrims came here to Massachusetts to stop for a beer. Since the newcomers couldn't get barley to grow well, the pilgrims brewed with whatever they could. They brewed hard cider from apples, Native Americans taught them to brew with maize. But they didn't have that barley available, so they were using other fermentables, such as the fructose from the pumpkin or the molasses from cane sugar. And they were using that as the, the base to ferment. Uh, and then they were, instead of hops, they were using spruce. Barley and hops eventually took hold in the New World, and American breweries grew along with the colonies. Naturally, the most common beers were heavy, full-flavored English ales, including a new ale, characterized by its darkly roasted malt, known as porter. It became George Washington's favorite. 
Many of the founding fathers were brewers, not just Samuel Adams, but George Washington left his recipe for porter uh, in the New York Public Library. Thomas Jefferson had a brewery there at Monticello. Uh, James Madison had a brewery in, on his estate and actually proposed the idea of a national brewery funded by the government. As conflict with the British became inevitable, beer stood ready to do its patriotic duty. The taverns uh, were the, as Daniel Webster said, the headquarters of the revolution. Thank you, when the Sons of Liberty wanted to have a gathering, the way they got people to their meetings was they threw a kegger. It's still commonly in use today to gather a bunch of people together. Uh, the um, with Sons of Liberty weren't alone. The militia in various towns they had established a training day. People weren't coming to the training day. Uh, but when they threw a keg of beer on for when the conclusion of the drills, they started getting a better turnout. The English ales of the revolutionary era began to yield to a new movement in American brewing by the 1830s, which saw a large influx of Germans and Czechs and their state-of-the-art breweries. These new immigrants brought with them the brewing techniques of the old country and gradually pushed them further west. Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis, even Golden, Colorado. Beginning in the mid-1800s, the new breweries fostered a series of breakthroughs that ushered in the era of modern brewing. The first was commercial refrigeration, was used liquefied ammonia to keep ice frozen indefinitely. Suddenly, brewers of lager were free of the four seasons. Artificial refrigeration really enabled brewers to make beer year-round, to not necessarily rely on caves to do their aging, so they could now build their aging cellars above ground. Adolphus Bush was the first brewer to adopt this technology. In the 1870s, he also pioneered use of the double-walled refrigerated rail car, which drew in outside air and circulated it continuously past large ice bunkers. A national system of ice houses kept a steady flow of ice onto the trains. By the 1880s, barrels of cold beer could reach from coast to coast, especially with the help of another breakthrough. Pasteurization is the other important innovation that was introduced into the brewing industry also by Adolphus Bush. And pasteurization is a simple process of taking the beer, gently heating it, for a short period of time, cooling it back down. And by doing that, you're able to stop the yeast from growing and allow the beer to maintain some shelf life. Because prior to that, the beer would leave the brewery and would usually spoil pretty quickly. The beer bottle also reached maturity in this era. There were innovations in glass technology that allowed them to have precision control over the size of bottles before that period of the, uh, the breweries had to employ people to bottle by hand. And the last great innovation, although small, had a very large effect, was the bottle cap. A uh, simple crimped piece of tin and steel that allowed the brewers to cap that bottled beer without having to employ an army of people installing flip tops on bottles. Machinery could put this on very easily, and it allowed the brewers to ship their beer all over the country. The late 19th century was the golden age of brewing in America. In 1880, there were 2,300 breweries, large and small. American brewers were winning gold medals at beer competitions all over the world. American beers were among the most respected in the world, and American brewers were making rich, flavorful lagers. The German-American beer barons, men like Fred Pabst, Joseph Schlitz, Fred Miller and Adolphus Busch built ever more elaborate saloons and beer gardens, ushering in an American version of Gemütlichkeit, the beer of choice, lager. By the end of the 19th century, ales had almost disappeared, and lager beer was just uh, immediately uh, complementary to the American climate. It was a lighter beer, a smoother beer, and uh, our hot American summers people naturally went for this later, smoother taste that, that quenched their thirst. But just as quickly as technology and culture combined to create the golden age of American brewing, 
politics and bad fortune conspired to kill it. World War I brought with it a lot of anti-German sentiment, and so a lot of American brewers had German roots, so that made things difficult. Then we had the greatest challenge we've ever faced, and that is prohibition, where it became illegal for us to make beer. By the time prohibition was repealed in 1933, the number of American breweries had been reduced to 160. The Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and finally the grain rationing of World War II drove all but the most tenacious breweries out of business. And each of these calamities had its effect on the beer itself. The brewers had less raw materials to work with, so beer shifted to a slightly different product, a little bit lighter in body, a little bit lighter in taste. They started using some things that they knew about from the 1800s, like rice, to lighten the flavor of the beer, and it just shifted the taste of beer and the way America drank. By the mid-20th century, the reputation of American beer had taken a hit. But another revolution was brewing. Soon, microbrewers and homebrewers would take matters into their own hands. In the decades of American affluence that followed the Second World War, the generation who had served in Europe, and later their baby boom children, returned to the continent to see the sights and to taste the exotic European beers. By the 1960s, the import phenomenon had begun. But not everyone was satisfied with these European beers, especially by the time they were unloaded from giant hot container ships. The first rumblings of a new generation of American brewers came out of San Francisco in the 1960s. Where Fritz Maytag took a failing brewery, but actually focused on that product that was not popular, just at the same time that this wave of enthusiasm for different tastes was coming back. Maytag bought the troubled Anchor Brewery, which had been in business since 1896. And eventually, by the time that the 70s rolled out into the 80s, Anchor Brewing was actually profitable again. So they led the way for a lot of microbreweries. Another success story emerged from an East Coast city whose breweries had nearly ceased to exist. When I first came to this old brewery here in Boston, I fell in love with it. There was just a karma. And I thought, I want to put my brewery here in this old brewery, because it reminded me of the breweries that I'd been to when I was a kid. Red brick, massive, little courtyard in the middle. To me, that was what a world-class brewery was going to look like. The 1980s and 90s saw an explosion of startup breweries, many of them achieving remarkable success. These upstart breweries, soon dubbed microbreweries, produced something Americans hadn't tasted in a long time, ale. One of these rediscovered recipes is India Pale Ale, or IPA, the strong, heavily hopped ale named for the long journey from England to India. Back when India uh, was a colony of the UK, uh, and they had all their troops and officers stationed over there, these guys were dying to have uh, a taste for the, the, of the old country. And they'd send the beer to them, and it would get there and be spoiled because of a long, warm trip. Through trial and error, they figured out that the stronger they made the beer, the more hops they stuffed into the barrel, the better the odds that the beer would survive the trip in good shape. American brewers have also made prize-winning versions of the thick, quenching beers made of wheat instead of barley, including the famously cloudy German Hefeweizen. Hefe, Hefe means yeast. So it says it's a wheat beer with the yeast inside, not filtered, with this natural turbidity. Cheers. Very good. And Belgian Lambic Ales. In the traditional method of making Lambic beer on a Belgian farm, slats in the fermentation barn open wide, letting in wild yeasts and even bacteria to carry out the fermentation process. Of course, we're not going to rip the uh, top off of our brewery here, so we basically track down the types of wild yeast and bacteria, good bacteria, that we're looking for and do our interpretation of this beer. One of our slogans, I think, was baby gut bacteria. 
one of the ways a smaller brewery differs from a national brewery is at the back end of production. Concentrating on filtration instead of the more costly pasteurization. And then once we get this all hooked up, we're going to turn the pump on and start pushing the beer through the paper uh, medium that we have to filter the beer. And uh, this is uh, uh, about nine microns, so it's, uh, it's basically a pretty coarse uh, paper filter, but uh, it's perfect for a brew pub or a small, uh, a small uh, setting like this. This will take about an hour to push the beer from the fermenter through the filter into the tank here. We will uh, put it on tap this evening. Many microbrewers learned how to make beer in homebrewing clubs, like Southern California's Maltose Falcons. Named after beer's main fermentable sugar, they're one of the nation's most respected homebrewers clubs. You saw folks coming out of various homebrewing organizations, including this club, who started concerns like Sierra Nevada. They bring this product forward and people are going, oh my god, this is great. And so now Sierra Nevada is a, a nationwide concern. In the semi-controlled chaos of the Falcons Clubhouse, brewers critique each other's beers from aroma to aftertaste. While President Drew Beecham maintains order. For over 30 years, the Falcons have met behind this store in Woodland Hills, California, where the home brewer can buy everything from bottle caps and a 60-quart brew kettle to hops, malted barley, and over 30 types of yeast. The main difference in technology is just a matter of scale. Compare the home brewer's heat transfer coil to this one back at Anheuser-Busch. Or this fermentation tank to this one. Thanks mainly to microbrewers and the home brewing culture from which they sprang, there are now over 1,400 breweries in the United States. In 1983, there were only 60. It looks like another golden age for American brewing. Meanwhile, those who have made it through the trenches and sustained a successful brewery have come to respect the big boys. I think the big American brewers are one of the wonders of the beer world. They are able to produce enormous quantities of beer at very high quality standards and they're making a very light beer. And if you make a really light beer, if you have any defects in flavor, it's immediately perceptible. The formula must be succeeding, because America's most popular beer is Bud Light. As beer pours ahead into yet another millennium, breweries large and small continue to tap new ideas, including the world's strongest beer. In today's world of beer, the glass is more than half full. Specialty stores are filled with beers from around the world, while freshly brewed beer is often just around the corner. And brewers large and small continue to explore the boundaries of what beer can be. Witness the organoleptic hops transducing module. The way it works is it's a giant food grade cylinder that's stuffed with whole leaf hops. You run the beer through the cylinder and the alcohol in the beer acts as a solvent and strips the natural oils off the hop leaves, puts them right into your pint glass. And so the hop presence is magnified and there's a freshness uh, that you can't get through any other process. Viva la de France. But there's more than one way to hop up a beer. Breweries are targeting late-night clubbers with hybrid energy beers that have a kick of caffeine or other stimulants. Samuel Adams has made a huge splash by introducing the world's strongest beer, weighing in at over 25% alcohol content, twice that of wine. This brew has defied the physical limits of what beer had been for millennia. The thick amber liquid that emerges has no head. It tastes more like a spirit than a beer. Sam Adams' Utopias pushes all the brewing processes to their limits to create enormous amounts of flavor and alcohol in order to take beer uh, into an entire other realm. 
Uh, it's just uh, this crazy thing. It's 51 proof. It is the strongest naturally fermented beverage in human history. Utopias is brewed with massive amounts of malt to create a highly condensed brew, bursting with fermentable sugars. Which we then ferment with this kind of ninja yeast that we've bred generation after generation over the last 13 years to take uh, the fermentation to levels that uh, fermentation's never reached before. This ninja yeast is bred to be a survivor. Typically, brewer's yeast dies in an alcohol environment over 12%. The brew isn't distilled, but like a spirit, it's aged for several years in oak barrels. Because Samuel Adams' Utopius is naturally fermented to reach these alcohol levels and not distilled, we uh, put into the drink all of the fermentation, esters, flavors, and aromas. When you distill, you're taking a very small slice of those flavors, focused really around the ethanol. So you tend to get uh, the bold, almost ferocious attack of the ethanol that dominates the flavors. Every time we do a new release of Utopias, we are tasting flavors that no brewer has ever created and no brewer has ever tasted. At that moment, you almost feel the link with the ancient Mesopotamians and the medieval monks that were chanting as they uh, enjoyed their double bach. At that moment, we feel this link with 6,000 years of brewing history. For brewers and beer lovers, it's a happy time. With thousands of years of beers to discover, what was old is new again. Even microbreweries are returning to the once declassé aluminum can to package their beers, since cans better protect the beers from oxygen and light. And whether it's born of bold experimentation or faithful adherence to a code of excellence,